M friends. Tonight we'll turn this pile of styrofoam into a diorama from Normandy 1944, or how I like to call it, cats and dogs diorama. This is my rudimentary layout with various contraptions, such as a paintbrush telegraph pole. This stage is important because I can mark out the borders of the diorama and thus know the dimensions of the base. That's the first step on the menu, because every element in the scene will be built around the base's shape and dimensions. The cheapest and worst styrofoam is good enough for this task, because at the end nothing of it will be visible once we're done. Case in point, now I know the shape of the cobblestone road. An easy way of fitting stuff to the base is by holding it temporarily in place and using the actual diorama as a cutting template. A road is rather simple detail, but something larger, such as, I don't know, a house, requires a more elaborate approach. It was completely carved from styrofoam and because it involves a lot of techniques, I made a very detailed video about its construction. I left you a link in the description and on the screen if you want to know more. Painting? That was carried out completely using acrylic paints, because other chemicals, such as lacquer thinners or mineral spirits, will melt the stuff. Again, it was a very involved process, so I made a very detailed 28 minute long video about it. With weekly videos, I simply have to break up these dioramas into episodes. Anyway, with the house completed, I had to ensure it would fit perfectly into the scene, Although the fit is already pretty good. I wanted to keep it removable right until the groundwork was finished. And I also wanted to ensure the bottom part won't get sunken into the ground. So I made this simple foundation from balsa wood. A slightly taller base can make the diorama more pleasant to look at. But it also gives the illusion of volume so to say. Be it earth under the scene or a mass of water if it's a sea diorama. Before I started working on the groundwork, I made the cobblestone road, again from styrofoam. However, before I glued it in place, I laminated the side walls with planks of balsa wood. This is a very soft material and it's easy to cut, however it can be also very easily damaged and too much wood glue will warp the planks. My remedy for this issue is pinning them to the styrofoam for about, about an hour until the glue solidifies. Here's why the road section is still removable. I can now glue it perfectly flush with the walls, which looks way better in my opinion. Holes in the wood can be quickly filled with balsa offcuts. Honestly, it doesn't matter if it looks crude, because after all, I covered everything with a thick layer of wood putty. A major disadvantage of this approach is the dust, so it's better to take this job outside. But the result is an almost perfectly smooth surface. But anyway, after gluing and filling the cobblestone road, I gave the sides a thick coat of black primer. There was still a lot of dust on the surface, so this will nicely seal it in place, and it'll be easier on the eyes. This is pretty much where the craftsmanship ends, and where some real diorama stuff begins. I started by painting the road, because working with styrofoam is a lot of fun, and breaking the diorama into smaller sections makes the overall workflow more... smooth, I'd say. Overall, most of the techniques were similar to what I used on the house, and yes, I did it again. It was all shown and explained in much detail in last week's video. <laughs> so again, I'm leaving you with a link in the description, but that's the last time I'm doing that. Let's now focus on the... Um, on the groundwork. Here I was immediately hit with a problem, because my air drying clay became dry in the air, although I started in an airtight plastic bag. Uh, because Slovakia is currently under a lockdown, I couldn't just go outside and buy a new package, so I kinda had to make it work somehow. Thankfully, I was able to revive the clay by soaking it in water. It was extremely messy, it wasn't fun at all, but it was better than nothing. 
Water made the clay soft, but it was still pretty hard to spread it smoothly, but I found that adding small amounts of PVA glue made it more pliable. This would of course lead to more problems down the road, because the clay was definitely going to crack, but luckily I only used it to smoothen out the various crude features made from styrofoam. Luckily it worked in the end, so I could proceed to the more creative part of the process. Once again I made my own ground mixture from wood glue, dirt from my garden, coarse sand, and this time I also added some plaster. I don't know why. The correct consistency should be a paste that's easy to spread but isn't too watery. There are very nice acrylic pastes on the market that can be used to create the groundwork, but I like working with this homemade concoction because the supply of required materials is pretty much endless, and because it has one very important advantage over acrylic pastes. So what's the advantage? Well, it dries homogeneously, so it doesn't just form a dry crust on the surface and the inner layers remain wet. Once the clay is dry to the touch, it's ready to be oppressed by spare tracks. <laughs> I like to be extra sure by pressing them really hard into the ground, because it's easy to misalign them, you know, and getting it right on the first try is quite important. Compared to, let's say, air drying clay, this muddy mixture has a very realistic texture. And here's another trick that ensures the 50 ton tank won't be levitating above the ground. After putting it in the exact position, exactly how I want it, I piled dry earth all around it. Then I soak it up with lacquer thinner, which has almost no surface tension and thus flows very smoothly, and once the earth is soaking wet, I finish it off with diluted PVA glue. Continuing with the texture, I repeated the same thing everywhere else. So sprinkle, soak it up, fix it with wood glue. This trick comes from Luke Towen and it's a sweet, sweet life hack. While the glue was still wet, I sprinkled the surface with short straws of dried up seagrass. Also, stones of various sizes. Smaller ones will add more texture to the dirt, while bigger ones will act as, well, actual stones. To make the ground as intricate as possible, I also added small amounts of leaf scatter. These are just leaves from the outside ground up in a coffee grinder, and also small broken pieces of dried up roots from various weeds and other horribleness from my garden. This was once again sealed with another coat of diluted glue, and I left it to dry overnight. Okay, so the bottom layer of the groundwork is finished, and the tank sits nice and flush. I was keeping in mind that this is supposed to be a dry summer ground, so I didn't press the tank down too much. Now for the grass. You might think that, oh, it's just gonna be the usual schlock with a static grass applicator, but actually, the real MVP is gonna be the paintbrush. You know the drill with static grass. Add random blobs of undiluted PVA glue, heat it with the static grass applicator, and then just remove the excess. I repeated this process three times with longer grass, and normally I kinda consider this to be the end of it, <laughs> like, you know, finished vegetation. But as it turns out, it was just a base coat, if you will, for the actual grass. So I kinda started adding longer grass made from a paintbrush, and the most obvious place for it was the telegraph pole. But I started liking the effect. In fact, I started liking it so much that I quickly turned this into a new discipline, planting long paintbrush bristles. <laughs> it totally transformed the groundwork, in a good way I think, and suddenly there are several levels in the grass. Yeah, it's a slow process, but it's very rewarding in the long run. I finished it with a few twigs cut from sea foam trees, these are very easy to work with, and going to more expensive stuff, I added a bunch of photo etched vegetation as well. Some additional vegetation will be added later in the form of paper plants, but what we have here is a good base for painting. I started with my usual coat of black primer. 
It creates a unified surface for paints, but the most important advantage of this step is that it allows me to post shade the grass. I very much like playing with highlights and shadows on tanks and figures, and it's very easy to achieve similar results on vegetation. I know it might seem weird, but at least for me it's one of the most satisfying techniques in dioramas. The entire groundwork in its raw, unpainted state is kind of a mess of various materials and colors, and static grass, for example, often has very unnatural colors to it, such as red, for example. When it's looked at from a long distance, it looks alright, but the closer you look, the more unnatural it appears. Overall, not painting the groundwork just because the dirt is brown and the grass is green is like not painting a Sherman tank because the plastic is olive trap. But hey, that's just my personal view on the matter. Another important thing is to match the groundwork with the weathering on the tank, so the model doesn't look out of place, as if it was hoisted there on a large crane or something. So if I used a grayish earth color to pre-dust the model with an airbrush, I used the same tone as a base coat for the dirt. Blending some enamel tones on top of that will make the texture and colors almost identical. Most of the time I like working with the wet blending method, which means I apply two or three enamel tones and blend them all together while they're still wet. But in this case, the approach didn't work and I just wasn't getting the desired results. Instead, I applied each layer separately, starting with the light tone, then adding most of the contrast and tonal variation with a darker earth color, and finished it with a dark enamel pin wash around large stones and tufts of grass. To make it look more intricate, I like to pick out some of the stones and pieces of wood with various earth, sand and grey colored acrylic paints. All these details are already there, but they need a little bit of help to become visible. When they were unpainted, most of them were just white, right? And this way it's easy to make them stand out, but also to harmonize them with their surroundings. Leaves are too small for an airbrush, so these are also easier to pick out with a paintbrush. Using a totally different shade of green will make them stand out from the grass. With the groundwork finished, I could now glue the house in place. And looking at the scene from afar, I think we have a solid base for some additional, not so small details. Such as a telegraph pole. This is an old mini art kit and it's really showing its age. <laughs> so I ended up using only the wooden lock. This one has some nice surface features such as knots in the wood, but the wood grain texture can be slightly improved with a razor saw. The smaller stuff? Well, I 3D modeled my own details and printed them on my Photon Mono SE. Thankfully, I have a real life reference right behind my window. The concrete foundation was made from styrofoam and textured with acrylic wood putty. My goal was to make the thing as interesting as possible, you know, so I added various small details and horizontal features. To put it simply, I just didn't want to have a bland wooden stick in the diorama. Painting was done exactly as you'd imagine. I primed it all black until I couldn't even see it and the airbrush was only used to paint the insulators, because you know, white can be quite a pain to apply with the paintbrush, and I also saved a bit of time with a light base coat for the wood. Various greyish tones were then applied in the form of heavy washes. And in fact, it was the same approach I used on the weathered wood that's on the house. Painting the styrofoam concrete can be only done with acrylics. Mineral spirits would just completely disintegrate the foam and the whole process looks like a slow-mo implosion, because the foam is just shrinking into a small blob of nothing. This is already shaping up to be my most ambitious diorama, so I kinda... Eh wanted to leave a small signature somewhere. <laughs> Maybe I should just stop looking around too much because then I'm getting these weird ideas. Anyway, the only non-acrylic weathering was a pin wash from dark brown oil paint. 
and of course a bunch of enamel rust effects was blended on the metallic parts and round chipping effects. Now I could super glue the pole into the diorama and that leads us to the electric cables. From what I've seen it's one of the trickier things in dioramas and it's very easy to make the wires all bent up which doesn't look very realistic. So I designed those porcelain insulators with a hole and a 0.3 millimeter wire can be threaded right through them keeping it perfectly straight. The excess was measured precisely against the side walls of the diorama and cutting was also performed with lots of precision, love <laughs> and passion. <laughs> Additional wires were attached with super glue and everything was carefully painted with a great acrylic paint. Another fancy addition was a gutter and a downspout. This one was made exactly the same, with the same techniques and just everything. And although I wasn't looking forward to it at all, it turned out to be a pretty important detail. The house just looks more finished with it. Alright, we're almost done. More vegetation can be added using laser cut paper plants. But as I found out, using every type in my stash isn't always the best way to go. In fact, it can be sometimes detrimental if there's just, you know, too much going on in the diorama. Notable examples are these flower bits, and yes, I totally repainted those, as well as these dandelions. They're small models on their own because each one consists of four parts. The bottom, the stalk, the base for the flower, and this yellowish powder for the actual flower texture, I guess. But they're totally worth it. They're one of those once you see it details, you know. I also have these photo etched nettles, but I didn't know they were pre-painted. However, the print has a slightly glossy and pixelated texture, so I slightly modified them with some acrylic washes. But I'm so glad they're made as one piece. I've seen paper ones where you need to glue the individual leaves to a stalk. No thank you. And finally, we're getting to the most important aspect of this diorama. Cats and dogs. Get it? <laughs> the cat was actually pretty difficult to paint. I don't know why, but it was an uphill battle for me. I purposely chose this black and white color scheme so it would be immediately visible against the brick wall or the top of the cement roof. The dog, on the other hand, was a total blast. I tried to paint him historically accurate, so to say, but his greyish fur was providing zero contrast with the cobblestone road, so I gave him a slight brownish accent. The dog is significantly larger than the cat, and he doesn't have that fuzzy texture, so I think that's what made him a better painting subject. So all that's left to do now is gluing the tank to the ground, and that has been a final dot after every diorama I've made so far. Once I'm not gonna manipulate with the scene anymore, I give the sides one more coat of black to, you know, sort of clean up any dust particles or fingerprints. And that is the ultimate conclusion of this project. My friends, this is the biggest and most labor-intensive diorama I've done so far. Yak Panther with stowage and crew, a large house, a large piece of scenery and a cobblestone road, two dogs and two cats. Whew. Yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> You're asking where's the second cat, right? Well, just because the Yak Panther is made out of steel doesn't mean it's not a cat. Anyway, this is also probably the first diorama where I'm perfectly happy with the composition, because if you look at it directly from the front, you'll see everything the way I wanted to show it. I'll be totally honest here. The layout doesn't come completely from my head. I had works of two great diorama artists as inspiration. Marien von Gils with his book about composition and planning, and my favorite diorama modeler Volker Bembenek, whose works have been a huge influence for me, especially his position on Hill 112 diorama. And of course, there's that one historical photo showing the exact Yak Panther I've built next to a house with the huge advertisement and everything, so 
yeah, it's a culmination of various inspirations and ideas. And the idea about cats and dogs, that actually comes from my Patreon, because we were tossing it around as a joke when I started building the Act Panther and showed the figure with the puppy. And I just liked the idea, so I went with it. Anyway, my friends, I'm a very sad to inform you that this is the last video I'll ever make in 2021. Yeah, I'm sure everyone is looking forward to the holidays and the new year. And I honestly can't wait to do anything but watch movies, play games and eat Christmas cookies. So thank you for watching, my friends, and thank you for your support in 2021. Yeah, it's been a very tough year for me. And yeah, and thank you, my amazing patrons. <laughs> hey, want to know a secret? Although I'm officially taking a two-week break until January, I'm already slowly working on the next projects for 2022. And you can see all updates from that on my Patreon page. We can also get in touch through DMs and comments, and every 3D model and detail that I've ever made is there. And there were a lot of them coming from this diorama. The insulators, street lamp, manhole cover for the road, uh, windows and doors for the house, the gutter, and a lot more. I also have these beautiful studio photos in full resolution, you can download them from there, and real life references and ideas for dioramas. So again, my friends, thank you so much for your support, enjoy your holidays, spend some time with your loved ones, and for the next year I wish you the best of health, because that's really the most important thing in life. So yeah, I'll see you again in 2022. And until then, stay safe, stay awesome, build your gosh darned models, don't just collect them. And crap, now I can finish it. Hmm. Well, cheers, I guess. <laughs>